Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to give it a few minutes so people can get logged in, but we'll start in just a few minutes. Thank you again for joining. Let's take another minute or so so people can get logged in today. All right, so let's go ahead and get started then. I'm Jeanette, I'm the Senior Director at SCAMP. Today's session is presented in partnership with Growing Hope Gardens, a nonprofit that sustains resident gardens at affordable housing properties. And they're gonna tell us today about all their successful programs, partnerships, and how they're improving resident lives at many properties here in Southern California. So I'm gonna turn it over to our main presenter today, who is Carolyn Day the founder and executive director of Growing Hope Gardens, and also Ramon Alvarado, who's resident services coordinator at Community Corporation of Santa Monica. So Carolyn and Ramon, thank you so much for being with us. It's a pleasure. Thanks for your interest in resident food gardens. I am the founder and executive director of Growing Hope Gardens. We're in our fourth year. Our project started four years ago with four garden beds at a local homeless shelter, and we quickly realized in partnership with the Community Corporation of Santa Monica that we were on to something and that resident food gardens were really important, valued, and of the moment. Um, Community Corp had shared values, and this is where we started our food growing endeavors. Next. We basically grow a previous slide. We grow resident food gardens and engage them in developing their knowledge of food growing, harvesting, and preparing in the spaces that they use by the staircases. In the first picture you see here by the elevator, we don't need full sun. Some greens and herbs grow really well in the shade. And um, we also launched our first urban farm this year that serves as a hub to receive donations, to sprout and grow the seedlings needed for the projects, and also to engage residents in a larger scope, food growing and community building endeavor. Next. We're a local LA-based nonprofit that is quickly expanding its reach. We found that we are the only ones in the US who provide this service. Um, and we've identified in LA County alone, 800 properties that are under the hub and spoke model that do have funding in regards to resident wellness. Next. I'm Carolyn Day. I want to introduce myself for a moment. I don't have a traditional background. I came to this country with a traveling circus. I'm a competitive amateur surfer, and I believe the strengths and creativity that my career path has taught me to believe in also helped me create this service that doesn't yet exist. Next. The exploration process is fairly simple. We assess the site needs and the resident needs and the community wants. We then create a plan and a budget on how to bring this to your property. And then through services, we help sustain the food growing space and the food growing community. Here's our 10 step easy project installation in more details. Ramon, can you speak for a moment of 
how it was for a community corp and how it is to create new food gardens at resident properties? Absolutely. Um, welcome to the space, to our viewership, both within Southern California and across the U.S. and perhaps even outside. I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Um, so a little bit of historical context. Uh, I began working in affordable housing in the position of resident services, wellness and sustainability, um, which means that programming is a requirement to properties that are funded through tax credits. I noticed that in the first year of being here that many of our properties had very beautiful landscaping but there wasn't necessarily an interaction between plant and people. And in getting to know our resident population, I found that many of the people felt, and I conducted surveys to, to you know, put this into numbers. Um, I found that many people were feeling isolated, disconnected, not only from one another, but alienated even from themselves, uh, anxiety, depression, stress, living in this capitalist system can be really overwhelming when you are somebody who doesn't necessarily have the privilege and access uh, that some do have the good fortune to enjoy. So I met with Carolyn, we were connected through a mutual associate, and we started a conversation on how gardens can be so much more than sites of extraction, right? The, the typical narrative around community gardens is that we plant things, right? They're just objects, they're not subjects uh, in, the, in traditional narratives. And then we are able to harvest. And that is incredibly uh, important right? Uh, communities are only possible with the existence of our very first community member, which would be the garden. Uh, without gardens, there wouldn't be civilization. Um, and, and I felt, and Carolyn felt, that there was a connection that was not apparent here, both between people, the land we're situated on, we're on Tonga, Kich, Gabrielino, Chumash land, I want to name that. And um, we saw an opportunity essentially to connect people to the land, connect people to their sources of nutrition, and even most importantly, connect to one another. Um, conflict is going to happen in any community, you know, music being a little loud, kids are going to be kids. And a lot of the conflicts that were happening could easily be mitigated if we were acting through right relationship. And that idea of right relationship really begins with ourselves and how are we relating to our environment and uh, the other than human and more than human elements that surround each of us. And so that's what we did. We, we started community gardens, um, began with one or two that had already, there had been attempts to create community gardens, and they hadn't really been um, tended to, right, in the way that we had hoped. And uh, Carolyn, did you want to say anything about that? or? Um, I yes, I would like to distinguish. There's the traditional idea of community gardens where everybody joins in a wider space and is allocated a certain square foot to grow food. With Ramon, we determined that each resident community would feel more empowered if they had the choice to decide how their gardens presented themselves. And I would say 90% of the resident food gardens are more under the communal model where residents grow food in different garden beds together, harvest as their um, seasonal or vegetable likes, present themselves and also as their their time when they work less or work more, they're more active. And also when there is hunger in the family, which we saw a rise in with the arrival of COVID. Uh, so there's the community model garden, but most of the gardens, the resident gardens that are now in place are under the communal model, 
where there's not an ownership of a specific square foot and everybody works at it and everybody takes what they need. And I've yet to meet um, anybody who didn't like that model. Works very well for under traditionally underserved communities. Exactly. You know, and interestingly, one of the, the, the big effects, aside from providing hundreds of pounds of fresh produce and vegetables and herbs to community members who are in relationship to the gardens, what was really beautiful to witness come to fruition were the connections that were being made within our community. Uh, you know, one example, at one particular building, we had two single mothers living across the hall from one another, both of whom were working two jobs to make ends meet, uh, both of whom had, you know, two or more children. And um, one day they, we were able to elicit some engagement and have them come down and work in the garden during a planting workshop. And uh, we assigned the plots for people to sort of not take ownership up, but to work for that day. And as the conversation, you know, mirrored the organic soil, it sort of became this organic process, right? Where the mothers began talking and one was from Ethiopia, the other was from Mexico. And before you knew it, all of the commonalities, you know, of right relationship started to show up in the conversation and then to revisit that particular community months later, these two single mothers were sharing childcare, right? Um, helping one another, one work the day shift, another work the night shift, and doing this kind of exchange. And, and this exchange is mirrored not only in human relationship, but also in plant human relationship, relationship uh, between the microbes in the soil and the soil in the plant. Uh, you know, I think that the gardens really are a testament to the fact that none of us anywhere do anything alone. Uh, we don't even digest the food in our gut alone. We have a community of microbes that allow us to benefit from the nutrition contained in what is hopefully healthy food. Um, so I just, I really want to stress that gardens are so much more than sites of extraction, right? There's so much more than just uh, physical food, which I'm not discounting. I just wanna make that really clear. That's critical, especially when you're dealing and serving populations who are food insecure, um, which I'll circle back to in a little bit. Uh, but as a depth psychologist, a decolonial depth psychologist, I think that it's critical to recognize the relationship of the psyche and balance and understanding that the systems that we live in that facilitate the need for affordable housing, that facilitate the need for a person to work two jobs when they have kids to be, that should be taken care of, all of those things work together in tandem. And it's more than just the brick and mortar. Um, I think it's great when we do create more affordable housing, it's an imperative. We see what's happening in our city streets and, um, you know, part of navigating that and helping to address that means approaching this through a holistic value system, an intersectional approach. Um, and, and this is something that Growing Hope Gardens and Carolyn just get intrinsically. And we have been able to create something really amazing and unique. Um, Carolyn, what would you say about that? I One of the garden spaces where this was most obvious to me was um, affordable housing and supportive housing that was for the elderly folks on a rooftop. Mm. And we did an opening uh, ceremony and a, a opening event garden launch with them. And the majority of them had never met each other. The gardens give neighbors a reason to say hi and to interact. And it be, was such a touching moment when the residents started a list of each other's numbers and apartment doors and said, one said, well, I'm getting a surgery in two weeks. And three neighbors said, remind us when it's happening, we'll bring you food, we'll bring you your mail. And as we think of the solutions uh, related to housing and housing shortages, 
I think it's important to look at the problem in a larger scope as well, where the humans are disconnected and the gardens give these humans a reason to connect and to elevate each other. So thanks for bringing that up, Ramon. Exactly. You know, and, and it's, it's this almost, uh, it's a positive thought contagion because oftentimes in, you know, market value societies where profit is, you know, the big motivator and money is the bottom line. I think that this has been helpful to understand that success isn't always measured in profit. Success isn't always measured in solely how many people you can house, but how are you housing them? Is there a psychological emplacement in the community where they actually feel a sense of belonging, connection, ownership? Um, and you know, in, in that sense, we're taking into consideration the three pillars of ecological justice and uh, sustainability in development. And I work with some really amazing people here at Community Corporation, you know, people in development who are understanding that part of the plan for creating an affordable housing community from the from the very first diagram that's put down on paper is to make sure that spaces for community gardens are centered, right? That they're just as important as having running water and just as important as having an elevator. It's a different kind of, it doesn't, appear and pop out at you right away in the sense that like obviously an elevator is important you know you can't survive without one especially if you have people that are living with disabilities um but equally important is the psychological components to building a community and i'm not saying gardens are the solution to all things right this just happens to be carolyn growing hope gardens in my own particular lens at how we can contribute to living in a world where we're actively serving the needs of both the environment and the people and the plants and, and understanding what the impacts and implications are when we do uh, you know, bring this to fruition, pun intended. So well said, Ramon. Uh, and in, in bringing it back to a more technical aspect, bringing these gardens is quite simple for us. It involves doing a site walkthrough, seeing where the hardscape, the existing hardscape is, the irrigation lines, the sun, and what uses the people who live there already make of it. We then create an MOU trying to identify the best sites for the organizations that prioritize the sites. We create also a yearly schedule of maintenance visits. We found that supplementing, so the maintenance visits happen every twice a month and we engage the residents. That's when we teach the residents that um, this is how you water, this is how you feed the soil. And I wanna make sure to mention that all our gardens are organic. We use no synthetic fertilizer, no pest troubleshooting. We're able to do this because of these yearly visits and staying in touch with the gardens. Another thing that's really important is the supplemental funding. So there's a cost associated with our service, which is less than the true cost because we're a nonprofit. We seek grants, we seek corporate uh, sponsorship and corporate volunteering and also um, foundation funding. We also found that having an on-site water ambassador is really helpful in helping the garden thrive. That's a resident that we identify as already being committed to loving the garden space who supplements watering. And through our fundraising, we pay that water ambassador, depending on the size of the garden, 15 to $30 a week. I would like to move to the next slide, which also exists in the technical realm and it's the garden planters. The most cost-effective way for us to come in once a community already exists is to look at the existing ornamental planters and convert them to edible ones. And the funding for that from the um, housing organization comes from converting the landscaping fee already paid to edible landscaping and supplementing some of the resident engagement and 
yearly community events through some resident well-being funding. Ramon, can you speak of that for from your end? Yeah, for sure. So as anybody who has worked with uh, tax credits in affordable housing or grants, uh, there's typically conditions set on that. Um, so, you know, you're you're given this money to build a project and part of the due diligence is to make sure that the residents who are sometimes coming from different cities, great distances across the country, uh, neighborhoods that have been isolated, traditionally speaking, sometimes through redlining or other factors, usually socioeconomic in nature. Um, Part of the programming that we offer, that we're required to offer, uh, you know, covers arts, covers resilience, uh, covers wellness, um, but doesn't necessarily always implicitly name gardening. And that's where we were able to say, hey, this is an opportunity to be creative. What are some decolonial ways that we can approach educational programming in our communities that will empower, serve to create more resilience, build relationship, uh, allow people to remember, remember, right? Because as we remember, as we work with the soil, what I've seen and my research has shown is it elicits an ancestral memory. You know, we are all indigenous people, Re regardless of where you come from in the world, you are an indigenous person, you have an indigenous lineage. Um, some are specific to this land, others from faraway lands. What is so curious is to know that we have in each lineage a, a body of knowledge, and those bodies of knowledge can be remembered, right? Uh, so not only are you remembering your lineage knowledge through plant and relationship to soil and so forth, but you're also becoming part of a membership in your own community. Um, and that to me is, is something really incredible to witness. I think that gardening not only provides the fruits of labor, but also represents a moving away from this modern tendency to, you know, make everything a commodity. Um, and so with our programming, we really move away from that model and we say, hey, how can we be regenerative, not only through soil, not only through our food system, but also through the very way in which we're living? That's well said, Ramon. I want to show the next slide, please. This is an example of an ornamental garden bed planter that already existed. It's made out of cement, it insulates well, and it already has irrigation. We test the soils to make sure there are no heavy metals. We feed the soils. And as you can see, it's right by the residents' front doors. As we visit more and more, we get to know the residents because they hear noises, they come out and they see us. And then we're able to plant specifically culturally relevant vegetables and herbs right by their front door. This is a residence that has three re generations living in it. And while the parents are at work, grandma and, and little man are um, harvesting for the next meal. Next slide, please. This is a launch day to 60 day later progression where we our team comes by ahead of the planting event and removes the ornamentals and with the resident plant and get their hands in the soil. We found that for residents to show up after work and see a garden planted is not as effective in engaging them as having them plant the vegetables and herbs where they like. In the second picture, you see some signage. In wanting, I know my job is done at an affordable housing or homeless shelter uh, when we're not needed anymore. And the way I can do this is by making sure that we're always focused on education. The signage that's there includes how to identify the leaf, what the nutritional benefits are, how to harvest it, what um, nutritional content that specific produce has, and also ideas on how to prepare it. Next slide, please. 
This can be done in any size planters um, where you can see the sunflower in the middle was meant to be a small, narrow planter. We're able to plant some um, sunflower seeds. In the first slide you see, there is some lemongrass growing and mint. And in the last slide you see, these are the lower to the ground ones. We have a half done planter where the back half is ornamental and the front half has strawberries, some hay, and in the middle, an artichoke. This might be my professional um, eye, but I think artichokes and strawberries are as beautiful as some ornamental plants. Next slide, may, please. May I add something to that, Carolyn? Um, you know, I think that that really what we're we're looking at here is just intentional landscaping, democratized landscaping, right? Where we are not just planting for beauty or aesthetics. Um, you know, over the years, I, I had a couple run-ins with architectural designers who really were adamant that, you know, the vision they had was, you know, fixed on lilies and or what have you. And I asked them, you know, well, will you be living in the building? Will you, are you the person who is going to be coming in at night and, you know, working a, a low wage to minimum wage job and struggling to make a simple purchase at Whole Foods? You know, this is a quote. I have a senior, she's on a fixed income. Uh, she, we put in some mint, they asked for oregano, they asked for thyme, and they were thrilled because the quote, I can't afford $6 package of oregano packaged in plastic from Whole Foods. That's an easy fix. And this is what I mean when I say landscape solidarities, because the landscape is existing in solidarity with the community that's on the land, right? And I think that this intentionality, I'm, it's going to sound maybe, you know, overly passionate, but I feel this should be in effect in every single community across the globe, because think of how much more self-reliant we could each become if we were responsible for producing just a little bit of our own food and then exchanging it, right? Because not everybody has the conditions on the land to grow corn or what have you. It's a, it, it is. It's a community engagement at the design level. And it doesn't just begin at design and end with execution. It, there's a whole spectrum, right? In between uh, the educational, the programming, the volunteerism, the emplacement, um, you know, we witnessed it. Carolyn, please carry on. Thank you. We've also seen um, during a time of COVID where parks were not as accessible, the beaches were closed, most of the families living in the affordable housing only had one vehicle. The gardens began being used by moms to read story time, to go have snack outside, to do some drawing or, or water. And the gardens took more place than I had originally imagined. The next slide, please. This is another before and after picture. It's not a very wide space. When you look at the first picture with the wooden raised bed, you imagine it's shady and nothing will grow. And you look 60 days later and there are tomatoes and herbs. And if I, I wish I had a picture of the garden now, but you know a community is involved in its space when the garden jumps ship and they start lining the garden beds with little pots and they start going vertical um, and then adding art and decoration to it. Next slide, please. These are the People Concerns Fly Away Home where we create a sort of closed feedback loop in the 60 day later picture. You can see in the back, there's water capture facility uh, tank. And we use that if there's a first flush on it, we use it to water the garden beds. It's way better water than what comes out of the faucet. This is one of my favorite pictures, although we've come up with a word of this is a lesson learned that in some in some sites, mostly where there are a lot of children, we have to factor in that there's going to be social attrition of the vegetables. 
The children are going to play ball. The ball's going to land on a tomato plant or the basil. The strawberries almost are never to be found because the children find them first. Um, and I think it's really important to have this food growing experience connected to the spaces they use and not necessarily in the back somewhere as a an isolated uh, usage space. This is a, a great example of it. Oh, and these, if we can go back to the slide before, these are called wicking beds. So coming into a space that's already been built that doesn't have necessarily the budget to break cement and bring underground irrigation for the garden, we've had to get creative. You can see in each one of these stock tanks, there's a tube that comes out the top. This is the inlet. Each one of these tanks has a bottom that is filled with 12 to 13 gallons of water. First off, there's a potable water liner dropped in and then some lava rocks at the bottom. You can see under where it says Bell and Country, there's a small black, that's an overflow valve. So we fill up the water tank in the white pipe it fills up 12 to 13 gallons at the bottom. Once it overflows, or if it rains, it comes out of the overflow valve. We know that the tanks are filled. And even though there's no irrigation, and even though there might not be an on-site water ambassador, the gardens and the root system learn to wick water from the bottom. These root systems are like caterpillars and their only job, um, the, the, only, the main job they need to do to exist is to seek water, they have these antennas. So plants that are in these wicking beds tend to have really long root system because they reach for the bottom where the water is and the soil as, uh, acts as a wicking mechanism. Next picture. This is another before and after picture of some um, wicking beds that were put in a space, as you can see, where there's no water access and we're able to break it with greenery and tall sun chokes um, on the right. This is a 60 day later picture as well. And we teach residents the sun chokes on the right that look like sunflowers, the root system is edible. So while it looks a little bit like ginger, while the plant is growing, it brings greenery and flowers and pollinators to the residents' lives. And when it's ready to harvest, we teach them to harvest from the bulb. May I add something, Carolyn? Yes. Uh, you know, this particular site it had a really funny conversation. We had a workshop, uh, Carolyn and Elu were facilitating. And um, the kids were amazed that the carrots came out of the earth and that they were actually roots. And when I pulled it out, one of the kids said, that's not a carrot that's full of dirt and that's not a carrot. Carrots are, you know, and I'm like, well, carrots aren't little shiny orange pellets that come in plastic bags. They're actually roots. And, you know, I share this with y'all because I can't express to you the potential for transforming local culture in the direction of sustainability with, uh, without these types of interactions. Um, I think that not only does it increase, you know, a person's viability for, say, a job or production of food at local uh, sources or creating community ties, but it's also helping each of us to understand that we're part of a living system, a living systems model, right, where everything is interconnected. And under modernism, the way we've structured our cities, the way we've structured our buildings, we're disconnected from that living system, which is an abstraction from us. We don't understand how we belong to it, even though we intrinsically belong to it without even trying. So this is important when it comes and it extends out into areas beyond gardening per se. So composting, SB 1383. It's been really challenging to get people to change behaviors around composting waste material, right? There's landfill, recycling, composting. SB 1383, you may be familiar with that, was the mandate that everybody begin composting organic material. Let me just tell you, when people see that the organic material 
that actually Jane and Carolyn have been doing great work with uh, over at one of our properties. When people see that, oh my gosh, these leftover foods actually contribute to living healthy soil, which guess what? Gives us more food, right? It's a chain, it's a circle. And we're part of that. And I think that when we can give these really tactile embodied experiences to communities that have been historically disconnected from that, food deserts everywhere, right? Even in the most wealthy of places like Santa Monica, because the barrier is economic, you know? So in any case, living systems, soil, sustainability, holistic, it's all integrated, Carolyn. You'd be amazed the amount of children when you ask them where these seeds come from, their answer is the seed packet. So being in touch and watching the slow growth of the plant, especially in this fast moving, fast attention digital world that mostly children are being raised in, for them to connect with a slow growth process from its birth until its death is, is really impactful. They can see once the flower is done, the seeds come out and we capture them and we just replant them or we shake the plant, they fall in, we water them a little bit and they come back on their own. This idea that we've created with Growing Hope Gardens this year was supported with the St. John's Foundation, which supports the St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica and also its City of Hope. So we don't have to prove that gardens, food gardens increase positive health outcomes. These large uh, foundations support us for it. The next slide, please. This is the inside of a wicking bed. It's a little technical and we'll leave the um, slideshow for you in the chat afterwards. Next slide, please. This is an interesting site, Ramon. Do you want to speak of the difficulties? Apologies. Um, yeah, difficulties. For, for, yeah, for sure. Um, so this is a property that is situated uh, adjacent, a couple of food eateries, uh, commercial food providers. And um, there have been some challenges managing the uh the the rodents right and and the bugs and that's typical of urban living right especially when we haven't reached a point where we are composting and and able to navigate that in a super effective way at this time i know it's going to get better um and so the solution which was actually carolyn's idea was well you know because the residents we take a poll we go into the community i conduct a survey we hold community circles. We talk about the needs, the wishes, the dreams, the desires of the community. That's who we're serving. Um, you know, so this isn't a, a, a process of imposition and top-down hierarchy. This is a community-driven. I have petitions sitting right here. You know, residents who want gardens. Unfortunately, the funding isn't always there, and let's hope that that changes in the future. In any case, back to this spot. Um, and so I really didn't have an answer, um, you know, aside from like natural pest control. And Carolyn said, hey, why don't we put some some critter cages around the garden? I'm like, critter cage, what is that? And um, sure enough, we, we managed to get a grant and uh, we were able to not only provide critter cages, but also to really beautify the space um they're you know they are beautifully done they're all natural wood stained with natural oils so everything is sustainable and organic and natural in terms of how these build outs are happening um you know we're not using plastics and and toxic glues or chemical fertilizers uh and you can see in the photographs that you know it's been a wonderful addition to the community People now feel like they can go out and sit and, uh, you know, enjoy being in relationship to the landscape closest to them. And a, a quick technical note in the middle picture, you can see a white valve at the back. These are also wicking beds that are made out of wood. I have shared in one of the last slides 
some videos of how we built this out. We removed some of the sand that was in the planter. We embedded the planters in the existing cement ones. And irrigation was an issue because there's a garage structure underneath this level. So having a wicking bed there solves any structural damage that would be created through an irrigation system. These wicking beds are self-contained. Next slide, please. This is another example of finding creative ways to add plants to the landscape. These are not wicking beds, they're stock tanks, and we decided to make them into uh, ornamental and tea uh, planters. This is the interesting um, rooftop with elderly folks. They can grab a chair, sit down and stand if they wish. And it gives them a reason to be outside, to get some vitamin D through the sunlight and to get to know their neighbor. And most elderly folks are on more um, limited budgets and don't have extra. So when the price of food rises, their income doesn't. So these gardens, we find that there's great involvement um, in these gardens. Yeah, and props to the development team on this particular rooftop garden, because it really is exemplary. Uh, you know, we had several meetings, we talked about planting, we talked about design, we talked about the fact that as we approach social justice issues, uh, and we want to enhance equity, sense of place, belonging, emplacement, ownership in the community context, that this intentional democratizing of the landscape, democratizing of the design has been so beautifully done here. There's like, a, you can't see it in the pictures, but there's like this shade canopy that's like really gorgeous. And it's right in the center with like all these tables. And then the garden is the per whole perimeter of the roof. And the water system is already put in. So it's ecologically, you know, respecting the fact that we're in SoCal, we got limited water. Um, so it's just this really beautiful example of how multi sort of dimensional approaches to integration happen from the development to the design to the planning to the programming to resident services to our you know, amazing partnership with Growing Hope Gardens, which I mean, shout out to Growing Hope Gardens because they work so hard. They're so diligent. I feel so blessed and lucky to have had my path uh, intersect with them. And, and I know we're going to be doing a lot more, but this is a, such a beautiful example. Right. And as a technical note, these are also wicking beds, but they're of the commercial type. They come already built. They're not custom made. So the, if there's any concern of overwatering on a rooftop, it's eliminated through the fact that they're wicking beds and these beds are self-contained. Next slide, please. This is my favorite garden of them all. Um, we found that we, we began servicing community corporations, gardens, and it quickly grew to 10 different sites within a three mile radius. And being a small nonprofit, we didn't have space to receive big soil donations or big wooden donations. And Community Corp was able to identify a narrow piece of land between the property you see on the right and one behind us that was too narrow to build and that they owned. And we transformed it into a quarter acre urban farm we divided the land into quadrants, did four soil tests in each quadrant, and have been building soil and community since. And it's done at a really cost-effective way. Uh, we found Growing Hope Gardens found that inviting corporate volunteering on the site was very efficient in that we have hand. Today we hosted Snapchat, 22 uh, counting department Snapchat corporate volunteers who worked alongside us for three hours. And as they left, left a $3,000 donation for us to keep building the land. So this model works very well for organizations that might have in mind the implementation of multi-sites in a small geographic area. This becomes their hub where residents can be invited to come and garden and grow food and where volunteers that are not from disenfranchised communities 
come in and do some giving back with their time and they're giving the three little girls you see on the right something that's really interesting in growing these gardens organically is that the soil is uneven there's sometimes bricks to step over well in the end it's really beneficial to the children and to their agility and to their sense of self and awareness to have to navigate these spaces when these, if you look on the right, there are no balconies, there aren't even any um, air conditionings. So what we did is along the right side of the fence and the whole perimeter, we planted 25 fruit trees that in time will provide shade. And these fruit trees were planted by the local high school football team. So it's really beneficial to create this kind of space. Absolutely. And if, and if I may add um, this, you know, this piece of land right here was vacant for over 45 years. When we first, uh, when Community Corporation first purchased this land, it had pretty much been relegated to, you know, kind of a little bit of a trash dump and nails and discarded sofas and, you know, lots of little rodents um, and we've been able to revitalize it using the hub and spoke model right because these you know we're, we're we're partnering with community members who are working class people and hard-working class people and so not everybody has all of the time in the world to dedicate to gardening uh, our society isn't really set up for that at this time um, and so the hub and spoke model allows community members in our buildings that live on the periphery to come in. And some of these folks don't have even patios, right? Uh, the building that they live in was put up in the 70s and there's just no access to land. Everything is concretized. And so those folks using the hub and spoke model are able to come in, build soil, build community, build relationships. Um, so I think, and this is something that has to be advocated for. Um, I'm, we're fortunate because we have some amazing leadership at our organization, um, but there's also sometimes resistance, right? Because it is unorthodox. And, you know, the idea of situating gardens as the primary member of community is not always an easy sell. Um, but I will say that once the advocacy is done and once people actually witness and, and hear the testimonials, um, I think that a lot of hearts and minds and bodies are changed as a result. If we can go back to the slide before, the first picture on the slide before on the left was day one. And now we go to the next slide the picture on the right is four months later. It doesn't take that much. It, the local tree trimmers drop off mulch. The local brewery drops off mash and spent um, hops. And it just organically grows. It's not a high budget project. We're able to do it really cost effective. And um, I'll just take a minute to share a little bit about my background. I became unhoused as a youth without my family when I was 17. And seeking food was something that was a meal by meal um, task for me. There was no fridge to keep food in. My backpack wasn't big enough to carry dry goods. So I take this mission really personally to bring food access to people. Next slide, please. Stuff at the market's all the same. If you, I'm sorry, can you go to the slide before for a moment? We have a youth group that meets once a month on the left. They wanted to grow corn so that in the fall they could dry the corn and have a popcorn party and watch a movie in the garden. You look on the right, it's three and a half months later. And then next slide, please. We don't grow the stuff that's in the market. We grow heirloom that is drought resistant, that is flood resistant. And this is the corn that's grown at the farm. It's called glass corn, it's just beautiful. Next slide, please. 
Um, the People Concerns Homeless Shelter Food Garden is really empowering. It was our project, our pilot project. And the social workers and the caseworkers visited with me and said, you're on to something because the residents that aren't participating or engaging in their own meetings are asking when the seed lady's coming by. I think everybody feels welcome in the garden. It doesn't matter if your shirt's a little dirty or if you're um, not feeling good that day, the butterfly doesn't care, the plant doesn't care. It's a great equalizer. If we can go to the next slide, please. This is an example of being creative with the space. It was just the corner of the drive through area. And if you look on the right, we now, the white container you see is a um, tote that carries water. There's no irrigation there. The tree is a peach tree. And the garden beds, you see little plaques on them now because folks are starting to leave funding for us to create these legacy gardens for their loved ones that have passed. If you look at the wall behind that wall is um, the line for the for, for food at Saint Michel. People line up there before every meal and wait. So the peach tree you see on the right one day, people in the food line behind the wall will be able to reach in and grab a fresh peach as well. Next slide, please. Yeah. Not to mention the carbon capture benefits of having uh, you know, green spaces and living organic soils and plants. You know, I, I think that it's important to recognize that none of us can individually recycle our way toward a sustainable, harmonious, uh, you know, ecoculture. Uh, this is something that must be a systems change. And this is an opportunity for affordable housing developers, for developers in general, it doesn't have to be affordable housing, to really, you know, put your put your back into it literally and grab a hoe and uh, you know work the soil and and start really deliberately creating these spaces that have a multiplicity of benefits we've lost that in this state of modernity and but we can take it back um but it takes action it takes organizing it takes money uh and it takes the will so uh you know it isn't doesn't always come easy but it's worth the uh the effort. At Growing Hope Gardens, we offer three services. One is the bi-monthly micro workshop maintenance visits where we maintain the gardens and it's on a fixed schedule. So residents know they come out and work with us. We also supplement another service we offer is when our uh, garden team goes to a site, they show up with produce donations. And this is twofold. It attracts people who would not necessarily be interested in growing turnips and introduces them to the food growing space. And it also supplements for nutrition. These gardens aren't meant to alleviate hunger. They're meant to um, feed the soil and add nutrition to people's lives. Next slide, please. The other service we provide is community garden days between one time to four times a year. We like to come into the space and do a more elaborate workshop that's about two hours long where we, besides planting and watering, we also teach them how to harvest, create a dish and share it in a communal way at the end. Next slide, please. This is our fresh produce distribution on the rooftop garden we were looking at before. Our paid on-site and garden water ambassadors, sometimes they're local residents and sometimes they're currently unhoused or recently housed folks that started out as volunteers with us and are now on a paid humanitarian stipend. And I'm proud to announce that we've had our first paid humanitarian stipend intern now onboarded as a Growing Hope Garden employee. She is still living in her vehicle, but because she's working with us, we're going to help and advocate for enhanced services for her to find housing and support her on her path to being more self-sufficient. Next slide, please. 
The benefits are obvious in the environmental fold. It reduces the food miles. It um, serves as a carbon sink. The healthier the soil is, the more CO2 it can trap and take out of our atmosphere. And the social, nutritional, nutritional, psychological, economic, and health benefits um, speak for themselves. Next slide. Our goal is to increase access to food, but also to invite the residents to partake in the beautification of their space. Next slide. We're, we'll be sharing this with you, but there's some informational videos and some press that if you have questions or are interested, can go um, take a peek at. Next one, different cultures, different herbs are shared. We've met folks from Ethiopia who were sharing in the same um, herb as folks from Mexico. And they were so surprised to see that it was an integral part of both their cultures. They had different names for it. And then again, these were neighbors who had never spoken to each other. Next slide, the Yerba Santa. It's really nice to see that there are foods that are not growing in the grocery stores that can grow in these gardens. Next slide. 58,000 pounds of fresh produce that we donated. We reduce food miles because when our garden team drives to maintain a garden, they just throw in the back of the truck the vegetables that we were able to source and donate. It's not an extra trip for us to do. Next slide. These are questions you can ask and scan through and see if your organization is curious about bringing more food gardens, um, just exploring. There's no commitment. We're happy to engage with your organization at no cost to see if it's possible and answer any question you might have. And with that in mind, you can go to the next slides. Connect with Zach Matheson, our new director of development. He can help answer any question. And we're also happy to collaborate on grant writing, which we've done with Community Corporation in the past. I think incorporating these food gardens in your grant writing plans can also help strengthen them and distinguish them from other projects. Next, that's us. Next, our current partners. I think there's a few missing. And the next slide is some of our supporters and funders that we really, really appreciate. That's it for me. Are there any questions? Hi, Carolyn. Thank you, Carolyn Ramon. That was great. Um, someone asked if you have resources or a toolkit on how to start your own community garden. Um, how to start your own? Well, they can call. They can call us, and I'm happy to talk them through. They can actually email Zach, and we're happy to talk them through the basics, so they can start from the from the start. I think the most important thing is to test the soil. Oftentimes. These buildings are, um, Zach's emails in the chat. These buildings are built on land that might not have to go through um, all the EPA environmental standards. And just finding a piece of land in the back and growing food in it can be very damaging because some of these soils are um, have heavy metals in them. So I would say test the soil, absolutely. And we can... I'll add that in the outreach link where you can get the soil tested on your own. Okay, great. Well, we are at time. And so we will share the slides with everyone as well as all of the contact information for Carolyn and her team and maybe some other goodies. So um, anything else, any last words, Ramona and Carolyn? Thank you so much for following us all the way through this presentation. Great. Yeah, you know, I just want everyone to remember that uh, social justice advocacy is connected to every element of our life, our food, our housing, our transportation, the clothes we wear, the people 
that we are in relationship with, the plants that we forget that we're in relationship with. So I, I would be very happy to have spent this time with y'all and appreciate your attention. Great. Thanks, Ramon and Carolyn. So we'll end it there and everyone have a good day. Great. Bye.